You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie from the US. And I'm Johanna from Austria. And you are listening to your favorite international podcast. First of all, I'm sorry for not being here last week. As Annie already told you, my husband was here and there was a lot of renovation stuff going on upstairs. And we really couldn't find a time where, would, uh, where we could both record at the same time without it being super loud over my head. So that's why. Annie did an amazing job all by herself, and uh, the good news is we have no more crooked floors upstairs, so yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited for your new floors. And you're in a situation with your house where it's a marathon, not a sprint. If you're in that situation where you've got people really making a lot of progress on an aspect of your house, you just got to keep going. It's like leaving the slot machine or the table when you're on a run, you know, like you just got to keep exactly. going. But I missed you. I don't really like doing this alone. All right. The other thing before we start, we just want to thank everybody who voted for us in the People's Choice Podcast Awards. That nomination phase is now over. So what will happen next is that the final slates will be announced on August 7th. And that's when we'll find out if we even make it to the final, which I'll be honest, I think it's kind of a long shot. There were a lot of really... This year is really hard. Yeah. yeah. Big, big a lot shows. Of big, big podcasts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know, we'll see. Slate voting will start on August 8th. So please, on the 7th or 8th of August, just keep an eye on your emails if you nominated us in the first round, and you might be chosen to vote for the winners in the final round. Yeah, this part is really important because not everybody can vote in the final round. They will randomly select people who voted in the nomination phase. And as we said, there are so many big podcasts participating this year. So even making it on the slate will be amazing. The online awards ceremony will take place on International Podcast Day, which is the 30th of September at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So if we make it on the slate in any of the four categories we were in, then we're going to try to set up a watch party, I think, um, so we can all watch it together. Yeah. That would be fun. That would be so good. Yeah. And that's it. No more asking to vote for the podcast awards. No more asking to vote in the podcast magazine Hot 50. Well, this year. Next year, it's going to be a new award season and we're going to ask you again. But for now, <laughs> you did it. Thank you. Woo-hoo. It's like when the your local PBS station does their telephone every year. That was our yeah. sort of, please, without generous donors like you, there would be no Fresh Hell podcast. Which is true. Yeah, it is true. It's absolutely true. I think that's it, though, right? We can just sort of get into it. We don't need to tell them to do anything else because they did it all. No, They're the best it. listeners. We, anybody. You've completed all 789 tasks we asked of you. You can Now you can us. rest, stranger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we've gotten the loveliest reviews lately. Thank you so yeah. much for those. We are so close to 1,000 reviews in the United States. Hang on. We have ugh, 998, y'all. Come on. 998. We have 998 American USA reviews on iTunes. So that's the last thing I'm asking for. Sorry. Okay. So I think we can jump into today's episode. It is a very, very sad case about the murder of a young woman that took place in North Carolina in 1901. And so today we're going to be discussing the murder of Nell Cropsey. This is going to be a two-part episode. We did not plan on it, but it just turns out there's too much that we need to tell you about. So in case you prefer to wait and listen to a two-parter in one sitting, I'm one of those people. I love a two-parter, but I got to listen to them both at the same time or I forget everything. So if you're like me, wait until next Wednesday and listen to both parts at once. I want to apologize. I'm having some migraine symptoms today, and I feel like my voice sounds a little bit slurry, so I apologize for that. And also, I want to make sure that you know that we will be mentioning intimate partner violence today. All right, so this takes place in North Carolina, in Elizabeth City to be exact, which is the largest city in Pasquotank County. It's located at the Pasquotank River, and I did look up Pasquotank ever since the the horrible... Piscataqua incident of our very first episode, I've learned. 
It was founded in the middle of the 18th century, so in the 1700s, as a trading post. Soon a ferry would cross the river, and a couple of roads were built, and of course they needed a church and a schoolhouse soon followed. The settlement was known as Reading, and in 1794 the name was changed to Elizabethtown, only to be renamed once more in 1801 to Elizabeth City. The city is apparently named after Elizabeth Betsy Tooley, who ran a local tavern and donated a bunch of her land to the developing town which is cool because I would have immediately thought it was Queen Elizabeth. I just always assume. Usually it's always kind of, right. if it is named after a woman, it's usually after royalty. Yeah. So this comes from elizabethcitync.gov. Quote, Elizabeth City was once a major seaport where four masted sailing ships carried goods to and from the New World. Today, the city offers free 48-hour boat dockage to the travelers from around the world. The Rose Buddies, the world-renowned waterfront ambassadors, greet visiting boaters with a rose, wine, and cheese. Downtown Elizabeth City welcomes residents and visitors alike with bookstores, coffee houses, and specialty retail shops, all located in historic buildings. Restaurants offer everything from fine southern cooking to Japanese sushi. A walk along the shaded streets of the six historic districts stirs memories of a time when Blackbeard sailed the waters and Wilbur and Orville Wright stopped for provisions on their way to the Outer Banks, end quote. So it's a place that welcomes you with cheese? Uh, sign me up. Right? I immediately want to go to there. That sounds perfect. Judging from photos, it does look like a pretty nice place to stay. Elizabeth City has been named one of the 100 best small towns in America and one of the best places to live on the East Coast. Today, the population is roughly 19,000, but in 1901, when our story takes place, around 6,000 people lived in Elizabeth City, and among them, Nell Cropsey and her family. The Cropsey family is a large family, and relatives are spread throughout New York, and Nell's father is a distant relative of the famous painter Jasper F. Cropsey. We couldn't quite figure out how they are related. I probably spent more time than I should have trying to figure that one out. I thought it would be easy, but it's not. Thinking cousins, maybe once removed, but they're they're related. They're related, yeah. So, Ella Maud Cropsey was also called Nell or Nellie. She was born in July of 1882 in Brooklyn, New York. Her parents were William Hardy Cropsey and Mary Louise Cropsey, whose maiden name was Ryder. In total, the couple would have 10 children, unfortunately, but sadly not uncommon at the time. One did not survive infancy, one son. So they had, in the end, six daughters and three sons. From oldest to youngest, they were named Louise Matilda, Aladda, Olive, Ella Maud, William, Fred, or Frederick D., Mary, Andrew Douglas, and Carolyn. I have to admit, I was a bit confused because I checked all the, all the years to make sure, you know, it's all the kids there. So I went to findagrave.com. And there you can see that Olive was born in 1885. Uh, there's even a photo of her tombstone with that date, which would make her younger than Nell, who was born in 1882. But everywhere else, you can read that she was actually older, so that Olive was born in 1880. And at first, I really didn't know what to believe. I was inclined to trust Find a Grave more, because, well, there's a photo of the tombstone, right? But then I stumbled upon Olive's own testimony, where she states that Nell was her younger sister and that they were 18 months apart. So there you go. I have no idea why the dates don't match, but Olive was the older one. Anyway, they were nine children, so that's a really full house. And in 1898, the whole family left Brooklyn and they moved to Elizabeth City, where William Hardy became a justice. The family settled in a house on Riverside Drive that sat on a 65 acres property. I didn't convert that, but it's a lot lot of land. I know that. Because I know that we have 0.3 acres. A third of an acre. We have a little, an acre. Is what we have. Yeah. And that's a lot. Like, especially for where we live, that's a lot. But yeah. I would say an acre would be... We have be... a lot for, for Austria. Yeah. That's a lot. It's considered a lot. Definitely. You have a gorgeous yard. The house still exists, but obviously the property surrounding it is much, much, much smaller. The house itself was built in 1891. I showed Annie some photos. She said she has similar woodwork in her house. Is it is it the same time period, right? No. It was... You know where... I, well, yes... My house is older than that. My house was here in 1813. 
but there was, and if when we post pictures of the house, there's, if you look at the details, some of the woodwork is what we had on, uh, on our exterior. Like just some of the little wooden details are the mm-hmm. same. I think they're classic. I think they're just classic shapes, but, yeah. um, it's a beautiful house. You're gonna, you're gonna like looking at it. So it was built in 1891. It was basically brand new when William and his family moved in. And it has 210 square meters or 2,260 square feet. Here, we would call that a comfortably big house. But with so many kids, it's, it probably was a bit crowded. I'd say. Uh, yeah, with 10 a, kids. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> 10 kids. Yeah. I think you and I both have houses that are a little under 2,000 square feet, but it's two of us and dogs, whereas 10 kids, I think... Exactly, yeah. I do think, however, that the oldest children might have been already married at that point. Like, Louise was born in 1877, so she would have been 22 at the time. Mm. Aletta was 20, so that's around marrying age at the time, I'd say. I couldn't find any info on that. But even if the two oldest daughters were not living with them, that would still leave the parents and seven kids from the age of 19 years to only a few months old. That's a lot of... But, you know, the good thing is, back then, it's not like everybody spent time indoors as a family like yeah. we do today, right? Like, you're all up at dawn. If you can walk, you're out milking or collecting something, right? To For just life. And then you get back together yeah. to have a meal and go to bed. I'm actually not really sure if the youngest, uh, Carolyn, she was born in 1898, if she was born in Brooklyn or if she was actually born after the family had already relocated. It's not that important. Anyway, they now live in this beautiful Victorian house with three boys and six to four girls, depending on if the two oldest had already moved out. Or if they were just like old maids. Naturally, as the years passed and the house was full of teenage girls, young men would start to come over to the house, uh, young suitors, so to say. And one of them was a young man named James Wilcox, who started courting Nell. I love the word courting, by the way. James, or Jim, how he was mostly called, was born in 1876, so he was six years older than Nell. And he was the son of the former local sheriff, Thomas Poole Wilcox, who had retired in 1898. In the fall of 1901, Nell was 19 at the time and Jim was 25. And the two had been together for roughly two years, I think a little bit over two years. And they had been talking marriage for a while now. They had, but there was one problem. Their relationship was not particularly happy. Now, let me make one thing clear. What we quote-unquote know about Nell and Jim's relationship, none of it is proven fact. We do know what other people testified to, and given what happened to Nell, it's easy to believe that the testimonies are actually telling the truth, but we can't be completely sure. It's on the hearsay side. Okay, here's what was said. Mary Louise later testified that her daughter had confided to her that Jim often had a bad temper, he would have aggressive outbursts, and that she was actually planning on ending the relationship. They'd been arguing and fighting more and more frequently during the summer and fall of 1901, and all of this, it just sounds like just a parade of red flags. It's just, Mm. it's not good. So, it's on the evening of the 20th of November, 1901, and Nell and her sister Ollie are sitting in the parlor with two male visitors. One was Jim Wilcox, and the other was Ray Crawford, a young man who at the time was dating Ollie. With them was, according to some of the newspaper articles, a cousin of Nell and Ollie named Carrie Cropsey. Everybody else had already retired to their rooms, and so it was just the two couples, maybe also Carrie, chatting in the living room. Well, apparently, Jim was not so chatty. According to Ollie and Roy, or Leroy, he was not talking to Nell at all during that evening, and several times he stated that he needed to leave now, getting up and sitting back down again. Okay. It sounds kind of tense. It's just very tense. Yeah. Around 11 p.m., Jim Wilcox got up one last time and said he was heading home, but he asked Nell to step out on the porch with him before he left because he wanted to talk to her. So Nell stepped outside to talk to Jim Wilcox. I think it's important to mention that Nell did have some problems with one of her feet. There was some sort of injury that made it a bit hard for her to walk longer distances. If Ollie's testimony has been read correctly, then I think she was also wearing two different shoes for that reason. Other than that, she was dressed in a brown skirt, a red vest or cardigan, and was wearing a brown belt. So they step on the porch, and shortly after 11, a neighbor passes by the Cropsey house, and he can see two figures standing in front of the house, but it's too dark, so he can't say who it was. 
A little while later, Roy also got up and headed home. When he left the Cropsey house, he saw neither Nell nor Jim on the porch. He figured that Nell had already gone up to bed. Ollie went upstairs to the bedroom she shared with Nell and didn't find her there. She thought Nell was probably still either outside with Jim or she must be in the living room or the kitchen, so she didn't think too much more about it and she went to bed. She couldn't have slept for long because shortly after midnight, she was awakened by their dog barking. They had a pointer, and I know many of you out there are dog owners, and we all know what dogs barking at night can be. It's startling sometimes. Like, if you Mm. wake up from a deep sleep to your dog going nuts, not a fan. And there are different barks. Oh, yeah. Uh, So this, obviously, was was the alarming bark. It was a jam-style bark, because everyone was wide awake and freaked out, and Ollie heard somebody yell, quote, Father, get the guns, which is never... Ugh, you don't want to hear that yelled when the dog is going crazy. And so then apparently William and the boys grab some weapons and they head over to the barn because, of course, your first thought is going to be something's maybe attacking your animals, right? Yeah. But once they got to the barn, they couldn't find anything. Except now that everybody is up, they did realize that Nell was missing. She's not there. So they're checking around the house. They're checking outside. They're calling her name. They're yelling for her. But Nell is gone. So now everyone is really scared. The smaller children and Mary Louise are crying, and the men are getting dressed, grabbing lanterns to search for Nell, who at that time must have been gone for a little over an hour, and they can't find her anywhere. So where could she possibly be? Ollie tells them that the last time she saw her was when she stepped out of the house to talk to Jim Wilcox, and so William speculates that maybe the two have run off to get married. But Mary Louise doubts that. Because, first of all, Nell was really looking forward to a trip to New York that was going to take place pretty soon. And second of all, well, because of what her daughter had told her about wanting to end the relationship. I mean, and I think that makes sense, right? You'd be more concerned about an elopement if if there were fights about the parents saying wait a little longer and her not wanting Absolutely. to wait. Or, yep. you know, them disapproving, but her being madly in love. And that was not the case here. It just wasn't. She can see absolutely no reason why Nell would elope. So around 2 a.m., someone is sent to the Wilcox house to see if Jim is home. And Wilcox Sr. checks and finds Jim in his bed, apparently sound asleep. And we're going to assume they woke him up to ask if he knew where Nell is, but it isn't until the next morning that they can properly question Jim. They do, however, now know that Nell is not with Jim. As soon as the morning dawns, someone is sent over to the Wilcox house to see if Jim is home and fetch him to question him. Jim Wilcox arrives at the house, and Mary Louise grabs him by the arm and begs him to tell her where Nell is, saying, Jim, for my sake and for your mother's sake, tell me where Nell is, end quote. But he swears he doesn't know. He left her on the porch crying and went home. Jeez, I can't imagine why she didn't want to marry him. So this is an excerpt from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch from St. Louis, Missouri, 29 December 1901, which is a Sunday, page 16. Quote, Wilcox claimed to know nothing. Wilcox was taken to the Cropsey home and for hours questioned by family. Quote, I don't know anything, said Wilcox sullenly. He recounted, as he said, all that had happened when Nell Cropsey stepped out on the veranda with him that night. About ten days before that he and Nell Cropsey had quarreled as the family knew and they had joked about it. Nell sent word to Wilcox by her cousin Carrie and her sister that she wanted him to bring back her photograph and a parasol of hers that he had. Quote, tell Jim I don't like him and that he doesn't count anymore, she said half seriously. The year before, young Wilcox had broken Nell's white parasol and had taken it to be mended. Instead, he brought her a new parasol on her 17th birthday. The two were always having little spats, and in the last quarrel, Nell said she wanted her old parasol back. Quote, I brought the parasol, a photograph, and some other things that night, said young Wilcox. When I called Nell out on the porch, I gave them to her, and she began to cry. She was crying when I left her and started down the path. I never saw her again. End quote. The parasol, which Wilcox says he gave the girl that evening, was found in the hall. None of the other things or the photograph have been seen. End quote. Yeah. Tell Jim I don't like him and that he doesn't count anymore. That's not half serious. Like, that you don't count anymore? Like, yeah. And who wants to hear that? I know. We're going to talk definitely more about the, their relationship oh, next week. for sure. But, yeah. Yeah. 
So after that, according to his own testimony, Jim left. He stated that he had walked around aimlessly for roughly 30 minutes to think, and then he ran into a friend named Leonard Owens. The two had a quick chat. Owens later confirmed this meeting had taken place. And then Jim said he went for a beer and then home where he went to bed immediately. Jim was arrested twice this day, the day after Nell went missing, but was released soon after, both times. So over the next days and actually weeks, the family and law enforcement started a huge search for Nell. Dogs were of course brought in to help in the search and they followed the scent to, I think it's a gazebo-like, or it was a gazebo-like structure. Sometimes it's described as the Cropsy summer house. Mm. Would that make sense that it's like a gazebo? Because I don't think they have a summer house, like a real summer house next to there real house. So you'll sometimes see things here referred to as a summer house, and it's like a gazebo, usually with screens. So it would be all Mm, screened in. So it would be a place where you could sit in the summertime and get breezes through, just really get a breeze. absolutely sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes they'd have like, people could sleep out there, like sleeping porches. So as I said, first the dogs followed the scent to this gazebo or summer house, uh, and then down to the river to their boat house. So, of course, the river was where they were searching the most, and theories were that she either committed suicide by drowning in the river, but again, her mother was absolutely certain that Nell was very much excited about their trip to New York, and she couldn't think of a reason why she would do that. Another theory was maybe she had fallen in and drowned by accident. But of course, why would Nell walk to the river all by herself? Because remember, she had an injured foot, so... That was kind of unlikely, right, that she walked down there. And then the sightings came in. She was seen in Baltimore, Washington. But each time it turned out that it was not Nell, but another girl who just looked very similar. Can you imagine, just, we have some some photographs of Nell, but looking at her her photograph, she was beautiful. But it's not like today where you get, like, really good images of missing people and a couple of photographs and sometimes photographs of them with and without glasses, different hair. Do you know what I mean? It's like... I know exactly what you mean. You can tell she's a stunner, but any, like, you don't really get the detail. mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would imagine that especially around this time, you know, there would be a lot of uh, mistaken identity situations that were very... Definitely. ...well intended. Yeah. So on 3rd of December 1901, Jim Wilcox was arrested a third time. This time, he was brought in to testify before five magistrates. They also called in four witnesses who testified seeing Jim Wilcox entering his father's house around midnight. Uh, And of course, there was a lot of discussion around how long it would take Jim Wilcox to walk from the Cropsy home to his home uh, with the two intermissions in between, you know, the time he met his friend and then the stop at the bar to have a beer. Then Jim's bond was set to $1,000. It's a lot of horse money back then, I think. Yeah, oh yeah. And I think the fact that he was arrested three times in those first couple of days shows what everybody was thinking. Uh, He was their number one suspect. I mean, of course he was. He was the last person we know of who saw her alive. Of course, nowadays we know a lot more about intimate partner violence and, you know, how women who are in toxic relationships are always at the highest risk to be murdered when they end the relationship. But yeah, even without all that detailed criminological knowledge, people in town were pretty much set on James Wilcox as their suspect. It wasn't only the fact that he was the last who saw her that made him suspicious, it was also how he behaved after Nell disappeared. It didn't seem to bother him all that much, like he barely offered to help in the searches. Although I have to add that we know of plenty of cases where the murderers were absolutely eager to help in finding the missing person. So that doesn't say anything. Right. Also, I think, and I know some people are going to say, stop identifying with the bad guy. But like, to be fair, I feel like that can go a few ways, right? Because if you insert yourself into the crime posing as a helper, or they think that's what you're doing, then you know what I mean? Or if you act like you're not worried because you're not guilty... Both things make you really guilty. It's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Doesn't matter, actually. uh, Right. People are going to think what they're going to think. Yeah. But it it is true. It's always interesting with cases to see who does what. On 11th of December, her father, William Cropsey, he issued a public letter and it read, quote, To the citizens of Elizabeth City and Pasquotank County, North Carolina, I take this method and opportunity of thanking the good people of this city county, and state for their many acts of kindness toward me and my family during the recent sorrow that has befallen us. 
I assure you that we shall ever cherish these memories and shall never forget to remember your many kind words and tender sympathies. The police officials and citizens' committee have done all that human agency could do to restore my daughter, but without success. I never expect to see her this side of the great eternity. I shall always believe that James Wilcox was instrumental in my daughter's disappearance. And if she is dead, I believe that his hand, or the hand of his hireling, is responsible for her death. Some time when this life shall cease, we shall stand before the presence of the great judge, and at that time I believe that we shall learn how and where he murdered my daughter, and the justice that he may escape here will be dealt to him there. W. H. Cropsey. End quote. So, yeah. That's an angry father, and he very, very publicly accused Jim Wilcox of murdering his daughter. Of course, Jim Wilcox, a day or two later, sends his own letter in to rebut what has been said about him to defend his own honor. And it looks like the letter he wrote, we think it was really long, and they just printed excerpts of it. This is what we found printed as a rebuttal in the North Carolinian uh, from Raleigh, North Carolina, 19th of December, 1901. Quote, My position, of course, is an embarrassing one, for the reason that anything I might say would be criticized and doubtless misinterpreted, and this leaves me helpless. I now say that I have had nothing whatever to do, either directly or indirectly, with the young lady's disappearance, and know nothing of her whereabouts. Neither do I know how she disappeared. The last time I saw her, she was standing on the porch, leaning against the post, with her head on her arm. She was crying. The last words she said to me when I told her I had to go over to town and asked her to go inside were, quote, you can go to town, end quote. I think the letter, which has been published by Mr. Cropsey, is unjust and is calculated to do me great harm. He has no evidence to justify him in making such a statement and no new discovery, and I am at a loss to understand why he should have signed such a statement. I hold no ill will toward Miss Cropsey and would have done her no harm. Both she and the family were warm friends of mine, and I hold them in the highest esteem. We have been the best of friends, as far as I know, for about three years. If I knew anything of her whereabouts, it would be a great pleasure to me to inform her mother, father, and friends. I deny that I am the cause or in any way responsible for her disappearance. I regret her disappearance as much as anyone else. It has been published in the newspapers that I refuse to make a statement. This is not correct. I made a statement to Mr. and Mrs. Cropsey on the morning after Nell was missing, and afterward I asked an interview and again went to the house and talked the matter over with them. When I was first arraigned, there was no evidence to hold me. I volunteered, was sworn, and made a statement to the mayor and four justices of the peace. I was asked about the matter fully and did not hesitate to answer any questions. I am informed that no new evidence has been found to show that Nell was murdered, and I was shocked and surprised to see the letter published over the signature of Mr. Cropsey, which I am reliably informed was written by someone else and that he was requested to sign it and did so. My conduct has been criticized unmercifully, and anything I would attempt to do would be misinterpreted. I want the mystery solved, and my attorney in open court stated to the committee that he, my father, and myself were willing to do anything that we could, end quote. So, (sighs) what else is he going to say? It wasn't me. As I said, there were so many sightings of Nell all over North Carolina, actually all over the U.S., because her disappearance had made headlines nationwide. Not only nationwide, it was actually reported internationally as well. And then a reward was set, uh, $1,400 was promised to anyone who would have information that would lead to Nell or her abductor or murderer. So obviously the tips started to come in, and as Annie said before, people mostly meant well, but I mean, if you don't know really exactly how somebody looks, I mean, what you're gonna do? People thought uh, the had uh, information that she was taken away in a carriage or that she was abducted in a rowboat. Then people said they saw her in Baltimore. They uh, heard her saying she would never return to Elizabeth City. But none of these tips led to anything. No sign of Nell. And on a serious note, that has to be so hard for her parents, because even though I'm sure they must have known in their heart of hearts that for her to be gone for any length of time would have meant something really terrible had happened. But you still have that hope, right? Like, Yeah, and every time you hear, oh, we saw her there, or we saw her here, I mean... It's the same nowadays. Yeah. Brutal. 
Yeah. So no sign of Nell until 27th of December, so that's 37 days after she went missing, when two fishermen found her body uh, floating in the river not far from her home. Now, I don't know if this next part is true or if it was made up by the journalists, but if it is true, it is absolutely heartbreaking because Nell's uncle, uh, Andrew Cropsey, was quoted, quote, My sister-in-law, Mrs. Mary Ryder Cropsey, really saw her daughter's form floating in the river before the fisherman, but at a distance was not sure of its identity. She saw the fisherman as they turned the boat and fastened the form to a stake. Mrs. Cropsey had gazed out into the river every day and night. The effect has been so great that one eye is injured because the nerves are badly strained. She sat up nearly all last night, end quote. So yeah, she was found by two fishermen. They were returning from a night's fishing trip uh, when they saw the body floating face down in the river. She was fully dressed. All her clothes were intact, so there were no tears. There was nothing ripped off. But she was missing a rubber shoe uh, that she was wearing. They pulled her body on board and rowed back to shore where she was promptly identified. And of course, uh, because the river had been thoroughly searched several times, rumors started to spread that she was only placed in the river shortly before she was found. Mm. I actually would love to know how far advanced they were in 1901 when it came to determine the time a body had spent in the water. Uh, we couldn't find anything about this in the autopsy report. No. And that definitely would have been important and interesting to know, right? Yeah, well, and also that time of year. I mean, North Carolina is the South, but it's not It's not shorts and t-shirts in November, December. You know what I mean? So it's very I possible. I think that's where her body was still in relatively good condition. Exactly. She could have been yeah. in the river the whole time, but just kept very cold. The coroner, a doctor named Isaiah Fearing, uh, with the help of three fellow physicians, examined the body. By the way, the autopsy took place in one of the outbuildings on the Cropsey estate. So that's something that was not unusual back in the days. We heard it in several cases already. I know. It's honestly one of the worst aspects of the cases that we cover, the older cases that we cover. It's I don't know. When you lose someone, it's it's always hard, right? That aspect of just expecting to see them in certain places at home. Even like when we've lost dogs in the past, we'll plan to go away right afterward just to get over those few days where you're not expecting yep. to see them in certain places, right? And it just makes me so sad when then they bring the body to the house for autopsy. It's like one more memory stacked on trauma. Mm. I don't know. I think the man eater ca man eater case was kind of the worst, but it just always comes up over and over again and I think this is here less because it was not she was not brought back to the house directly. Right. It was it wasn't the dining room table. The, it was an outbuilding. Yeah. yeah. So I mean obviously it's horrible, but at least it's there's some distance between Definitely. Her, her family and yeah. yeah. So the autopsy report. Uh Nell showed very little sign of decomposition, as I said before. Her face showed some discoloration. And at first, they didn't find any marks that indicated some form of violence or any trauma caused by an accident, for example. So very early on, the theory of suicide resurfaced, but soon the coroner did notice a concussion on her left temple that was caused by a blow to that side of her head. In Dr. Fearing's opinion, that blow might have been administered with some kind of, quote, padded instrument, unquote. What do you reckon that could be? I don't... Padded instrument. At first I thought he said like a pedal, but it was padded instrument. Padded, yeah. Like maybe the a parasol swung like a bat or... Hmm. I don't know. Padded instruments, like a footstool or... Maybe, or you, um, you know, put like a scarf around it to soften the blue a little bit or to, to make no noise. I don't know. Oh, maybe. I, really, I was thinking about that a lot yesterday. Yeah. He thought that the blow might have probably not killed her, but rendered her un unconscious. But there was no water in her lungs, which we all know means that she didn't drown. The coroner's jury issued the following statement, quote, We, the coroner's jury, having been duly summoned and sworn by Dr. I. Fearing to inquire what caused the death of Ella M. Cropsey, 
do hereby report that from the investigation made by three physicians of Elizabeth City and from their opinion and also from our personal observations that Ella M. Cropsey came to her death by being stricken a blow on the left temple and by being drowned in the Pasquatank River. We have not yet investigated nor heard any testimony as to who inflicted the blow and did the drowning. We are informed that one James Wilcox is charged with same and is now in custody. We recommend that investigation as to his or anyone else's probable guilt be had by one or more magistrates in Elizabeth City Township and that said Wilcox be held to await said investigation. End quote. So this is in fact a bit contradicting uh, to Dr. Fearing saying that there was no water in the lungs because they mentioned twice that she was she had received a blow to her and was drowned. I was trying to figure out what could have happened there. I think what happened is that the official statement was issued before they had examined her organs. That makes sense. Yeah. Because the statement was eagerly awaited by the people of Elizabeth City and they were waiting outside of the coroner's office. So my guess is that they wrote up that statement and read the statement once they found that violence had been involved, and therefore it was neither an accident nor a suicide, but that they released the statement to satisfy the public, even though they didn't have all the exact details yet. Yeah. 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 I, that's just my guess, because the way it's written up, it sounds like she she died by drowning, right? Yeah, it does. It does. But... Or maybe they mean she died through the blow and then was drowned in the river. But right. drowning is drowning, so... Right. Yeah. Or it's. I guess it's also possible... I, again, it's hard to know how much they knew about things back then, right? Like, there are other ways that you can be smothered or killed where it maybe it wouldn't show and there wouldn't be water in your... I'm not 100% sure, but obviously it was a murder. I guess that's the most important thing, yeah. right? Yeah, but now it's obvious that Nell had been murdered. And of course, this news spreads like wildfire all over Elizabeth City. People were ready to storm the jail where Jim Wilcox was held. They were threatening to take matters in their own hand and lynch him, uh, the sheriff and his deputies, and the naval reserve that was called in to guard the jail. They had their hands full, trying to do their best to keep Wilcox alive long enough so that he could go to trial. So they locked him in what they called a murderous cage. That was not because they were worried that he might flee, but this quote-unquote cage was what they said to be the strongest one in their jail, and that was to protect him from the angry people of Elizabeth City. Of course, he kept insisting that he was innocent. Mm, of course. On 29th of December, a funeral service was held in the Methodist Church in Elizabeth City. The Morning Post, Raleigh, North Carolina, 31 December, 1901, page 1. Quote, As the hearse left the Cropsey residence, followed by father and mother, sisters and brothers, uncle and cousin, and a long procession of sympathetic friends, and moved slowly toward the church, the solemn tolling of the bell, the gentle lapping of the waters beneath whose waves the dead girl had rested for thirty-seven days, and the suppressed sobs of the bereaved sounded a sad requiem, while the weeping clouds sent down their crystal drops to mingle with the tears of the sorrowing. As the corpse was borne to the chancel, the choir sang softly and sweetly, Asleep in Jesus. A wreath of floral offerings lay upon the handsome casket. These were silent but eloquent tributes of love. The beautiful burial service was impressively read by Rev. D. H. Tuttle, who afterwards preached a touching and appropriate sermon, Rev. C. W. Duke and J. J. Ferriby assisting in the services. Lead kindly light and abide with me were rendered with melting pathos. The vast congregation was moved to tears. At the conclusion of the services, the remains were placed in the annex of the church where they remained until taken to New York. End quote. On 30th of December, 1901, Nell Cropsey's body was taken to Brooklyn. 800 people gathered at the Elizabeth City train station to say one last goodbye before her casket was taken on board the train. She was laid to rest on Tuesday, the 31st of December, New Year's Eve, at 11 a.m. at the new Utrecht Reform Dutch Burying Ground in Brooklyn, the area where Nell had grown up before her family had moved to North Carolina. There's a user on Find a Grave that has posted a photo of her headstone. I guess they had to have a, a member of the Historical Society help them find it because the stone is so weathered because of acid rain that there's no trace of an inscription anymore. So unless you have, like, 
the master map of where everybody is. While this very sad farewell to this beautiful young woman took place, the Elizabeth City Sheriff's Department was facing some serious logistical problems. They had to figure out a way to get Jim Wilcox from Elizabeth City to Norfolk, Virginia, and again to keep him safe until March when his trial was scheduled to take place. So what they did is they formed three groups of people, and then they sent them off in different directions so that people wouldn't know in which party the alleged murderer was being transported, where he was transported to, and if he was even transported anywhere. Maybe he was still in the city jail. Who can say? We really don't know. (laughs) We really don't know. We don't know. We really don't. And this is where we're going to leave you. (laughs) If you think, though, that this case ends with just one trial and one verdict, you are sorely mistaken. There is a lot to talk about, and we don't want to rush through it. There are theories, two trials, a lot of rumors, a very mysterious letter, some conspiracy theories, a lot of tragedy, and yes, a haunting. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know that some listeners do not really like two-part episodes, but let me tell you, we very rarely start into a case thinking that it will be a two-parter for sure. Mostly we think that this is a very straightforward case and it's going to be easy to write up. And and then when we do the research and start taking notes, we do realize that there's just too much for one episode. Yeah. And we don't want to skip important parts or not tell you about articles we we found or skip some theories. So that's why sometimes Annie then gets a message from me and I say, I I think this is going to be a two-part episode. Yeah. And And she's like... Okay, or the other way around. Yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. That's how it happens, yeah. Yeah. I, do you think people don't like them? I love two-parters. I hope you guys like them. I think the, it's, it's, you either love them or hate them. Yeah. Well, it's hard. You, you don't want to, it's hard to wait to find out what's, we hate to leave you with the cliffhanger. Um, yeah. But, you know, it'll be all right. Okay. In the United States, the National Domestic Violence Hotline is 1-800-799-7233, or you can text START to 88788. So if you need help, please reach out to people who can do that for you. If you Google it, you'll find lots of resources. Johanna has an info for Austria, right? For Austria, if you are victims of domestic violence and the hotline is 0800 555 it's a sad case. It doesn't have Very. a happy ending. So, Do you have something good? So my something good is Johanna was very sneaky and very naughty, and she nominated me for... <laughs> <laughs> it's a major award. No, it's... um Podcast Magazine was doing... Has done a piece about 40 podcasters over the age of 40, and I made the cut. So I am in Podcast Magazine this month. It's really, it really is an honor to be included. I'm very sad that I didn't see it and nominate her. So now I'm going to be on the hunt if anybody seems anything I can nominate Johanna for. But thank you. Sincerely, thank you for that. I appreciate it. My something good is, well, I said my husband was here. And my something good is we did not only work upstairs, we also managed to catch up on Stranger Things. Now we decided to start all over again from season one first episode because so much time had passed we stopped after uh, season two because yeah we didn't have really time to watch and we didn't remember quite much and we managed it (laughs) in 10 days while also working and do a lot of stuff to watch all four seasons and we loved it do you love it it was really great yeah and i'm so happy that uh, i'm not gonna spoil anything but i'm so happy i always loved kate bush in in a i always found her very weird but amazing awesome. yeah and i'm so happy that she gets some recognition by younger younger generations now it's amazing which is fantastic yeah fantastic we really really i think my favorite Stranger song Things. and video of her is uh cloudbuster nice i don't know if i have a favorite i wasn't allowed to watch mtv as a kid yeah i love kate bush it also makes me laugh that all these young people are like check out this new band metallica yeah <laughs> it's like uh <laughs> That was a good moment in the show. And the guy, the actor that plays Eddie, I can't remember his real name, but he is a delight. Like everything I yeah. have seen with him in it, he is just, I just think he's the most lovely. He's going into that little bag I have that like, those young actors where I feel like an aunt toward them or, you know, it's a very, <laughs> it's a very, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a very innocent feelings I have toward them, but he just seems like such a nice young man. 
Yeah. What a <laughs> nice, <laughs> what a nice young boy. Aren't you a handsome young man? <laughs> Give him a little slap on the uh, cheek. Dusty candy. Be on my way. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. Please, we need two more reviews, just two in iTunes. That would be super. I'm still going to keep asking for reviews, obviously, but then I'll reach my big yeah. goal for sure. Uh, thank you again for voting. Thank you, thank you, thank you for voting for us and for thank the you other so much. nominated podcasts because there's yeah. a lot of really great shows, even the ones that we're pretty sure are going to crush us. There are a lot of really great shows out there, so thank you. Good luck. If you want any information on us, uh, how to get in touch with us, our email, our PO box, a link to our Patreon. We had a lovely, well, not lovely, Annie was missing this time, game night uh, last week. I was really sorry to miss it. I really, really was. Yeah. Please go to our webpage, which is freshhellpodcast.com. There you find links to everything. Uh, our merch store where you get awesome tote bags. My mom just ordered a tote bag behind my back, which is so sweet. I love that. Patreon, you can also go to Patreon directly and search Fresh Hell. We pop right up. We have three tiers. Uh, it's our Patreon is just as random as this podcast, <laughs> as the Facebook group, <laughs> as we are. It's us. What can I tell you? Uh, Facebook group is a good word. Come and join our Facebook group before we get removed because I posted a photo of Pablo Escobar well, three years ago. Ages ago, so, when, the, when it was go. brand, brand new, like brand new. We used, Johanna used to yeah. do mugshot Mondays, mugshot Friday, some mugshot thing. Mugshot Fridays, I think. And it yeah. was so much fun and people really enjoyed it. And people were really good at it. Yeah, really like good at it. I posted mugshots and people had to guess who it was. It was not just criminals, it was often actors or. Oh, yeah, yeah. just a bunch of random, random stuff. Anybody M who ever yeah. had a mugshot taken. And now. Because of that, she keeps getting violation after violation for promoting violence. Because mm. oh, that's what we're <laughs> it's all true. And about. they always met because of um, Pablo Escobar. And yeah. they always say I promote a criminal organization, which I, I really don't. No, that's not I what don't. we're doing at all. Very much the opposite, yeah. in fact. It's fine. But come join the Facebook so group yeah, before we join. get shut down. Other than that, please tell your pets we said hi. Mm. All your dogs, not just the pointers. All your cats, all, the pets. all your guinea pigs, all your wallabies, all your crows, all your uh, cockaburras. I don't even know. So many pets. Um, <laughs> reptiles. Do we have a lot of reptiles? I never hear about them. We do like reptiles. Show us your snakes. Show us your lizards. The only thing we don't want to see are your arachnids. Where are the lizards? Where are the snakes? We've seen the axolotls. They get the point. Be kind to all of your pets. <laughs> Be kind to your fellow human being. And... The hardest part of all, be kind to yourself. That really is the hardest, for sure. And, uh, like, we, as we always say at the end of the episode, if you're going through hell, keep going. Choose and choose. Bye. <laughs> choose. Just choose. Choose.